Welcome to Deep Dive. I'm Margaret Lyman. I'm the director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. In this series, I speak to scientists from Scripps and take a deeper look at some of their latest science. And today, I'm very, very pleased to be joining Wen Yuan Fang. He is an assistant professor of geophysics within the Institute for Geophysics and Planetary Physics at Scripps. He is an observational seismologist who uses seismic records collected both onshore and offshore to study the earth and seismic sources. He's interested in earthquake rupture propagation, earthquake interactions and triggering processes, and the mechanisms of environmental seismic sources, such as landslides and glacial quakes. And he's a relatively new faculty member here. He joined us from Florida State University in July of 2020. He is also an alum of Scripps and earns his PhD in earth science within the geophysics curricular group. So thank you for joining me today, Wen Yuan. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. And I'd like to start by asking you, what is an observational seismologist and how did you become interested in this field? Right, so observational seismologists focus on the seismic wiggles, the seismic waves. So this is in contrast to computational seismologists who focus on models. So I try to uh, stay open-minded and try to understand uh, what the information are hidden behind uh, seismic waves. Uh, for example, the earth structure or earthquakes uh, for my case. Uh, it's almost like a puzzle, and I, I really enjoy trying to discover new phenomena uh, from those uh, time series. Um, and as I got into seismology, it's somewhat a random process, but somewhat um, like just natural for me. I like um, math, physics, and programming, and <laughs> seismology happened to be the perfect combo for this. Uh, so uh, when I uh, got to know there was such a discipline for me, for me to work on, I, I was quite happy. So it, it en ends up well uh, for me to be here. And I want to emphasize that seismic data are very powerful and they're always correct. It's only the incomplete understanding of the data can be wrong, but the data are always right. Um, okay. Besides all this fun part, uh, uh, seismology very much focused on earthquakes and that's a very uh, important motivation for me to stay in the field and try to make contributions. Well, you said that you focus on earthquakes, but as you know, I work closely with many scientists in the Gulf of Mexico, and I've heard that you also have done some work with submarine landslides in the Gulf of Mexico. So what are those and how do you learn about them using seismology? Thank you for asking that. I actually really wanted to talk to, uh, to you about this because I, <laughs> I knew you would like it. Uh, so um, landslides are the counterparts of, submarine landslides are the counterparts of uh, landslides that we often encounter onshore. Now, they are basically the same phenomena. We have a block of mass sliding downhill driven by gravity and they eventually stop there causing a large pile of debris. At the same time, it's also quite different. Um, a few points, first they happen uh, underwater. So uh, somehow the size and volume of submarine landslides are often much, much bigger than terrestrial landslide. The other difference is they can occur at uh, the uh, topographic relief with one to two degrees, basically very gentle hills and which are often prohibitive or almost impossible to have a terrestrial landslide because of the lack of the momentum to cause it to go down. But these things can happen in the ocean. Now, because of that, both active margins and passive margins are susceptible to submarine landslides. For example, like Gulf of Mexico, it's quite a passive margin. We don't really have even many faults here, um, but they still occur actually more actively than our other regions. Now, because of this, it could generate tsunami, and it could also cause uh, damages to the offshore infrastructure. For example, all the cables and um, uh, oil platforms for the Gulf of Mexico case. So 
last year, recently, we uh, found there were 85 previously unknown large submarine landslides occurring in the Gulf of Mexico from 2008 to 2015. So I, I know you look shocked because this is somewhat a, a yeah. controversy because from our understanding, it's not supposed to happen that frequently, right? So it was thought to be driven by the deglaciation of last ice age. It has been a while. So people thought it's an Asian thing, not the current thing. But what we found was on average, there are more than 10 summer landslides happen in the Gulf of Mexico. Some of them occur spontaneously. So you can think of as an earthquake event without any warning just happens. And the majority of them, 75 of them, actually were preceded by earthquakes. And because of the spatial temporal correlation, the 75 events were triggered by the passing seismic waves. Now the waves do not need to be strong. They can be as large or as small, uh, in our case, as a magnitude five earthquake, which are quite often along the uh, West Coast or the uh, uh, Pacific and, uh, and the North American plate boundaries. And all these events frequently just trigger some landslides in the Gulf of Mexico, um, which can really cause some potential damages in the future. So how big would one of these landslides be, or submarine landslides be? Yeah, that's a very good question. So far, I don't know. The, because <laughs> what, what we can do is based on the seismic records, try to come up with some scaling relationships and go back to infer the mass volume. Now, if the scaling relationships hold true, it could be millions of tons of rocks and sediments. Um, but we have not observed a significant tsunami generated by this 85 event. So it's sort of in between that could generate strong seismic signals, but might not have been able to produce a large observable tsunami. So the question here is, is that real, right? So um, to understand this, we're still in the progress trying to under try to decipher in the exact physical mechanisms and also try to first benchmark and validate our observations. And uh, we're actively pursuing fundings, trying to have a campaign experiment in the Gulf of Mexico. And also, we hope to find collaborations with industry partners and also consulting companies and to really work together uh, to reduce the risk. Because honestly, no one wants another oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. We're still, still dealing with the consequences from the horizon uh, BP oil spill. So, so it, it really is a collaborative effort and everyone wants to solve this problem. Very interesting. So in the, a talk that you gave at Scripps uh, a few months ago, you also mentioned storm quakes. So tell me about storm quakes. <laughs> yes. So first, storm quakes are not earthquakes. They are harmless and uh, when you compare to the storms that are generating them, it's it's really doesn't produce that much energy. I know it has those kind of a Sharknado vibe in it, in the name that is a combo of two hazards, but uh, it is actually a, a type of ocean um, and solid earth interaction uh, between the passing waves and the topography. So uh, this really a, a, a thing that, uh, is a perfect research topic as scripts because um, what we found um, was that during large storms, for example, hurricanes or nor'easters, uh, they can travel closer to the coast. When they get closer to the coast, they can produce some of the seismic signals recorded across the whole US um, as if a magnitude 3.5-ish earthquake um, has happened in that region. So how does that work? It, it, it's a complicated story. When, when hurricanes or storms approach the land, uh, they would drive the ocean surface with them, right? So these are what we often call as wind waves or gravity waves um, for the uh, physical oceanographers. When these gravity waves propagate along uh, the ocean and when it meets a perfect or preferable uh, bathymetry setting, they will start to interfere with each other nonlinearly. 
such nonlinear wave nonlinear wave wave interaction would produce energy leakage and produce a different type of wave, which is called infragravity waves. These infragravity waves have lower frequency, which means longer period and larger wavelengths can touch the seafloor because of the spatial extent. Now, once they start to touch the seafloor, uh, interaction is uh, inevitable. The reason for that is we know the when we think about the ocean uh, seafloor is never flat. There are all sorts of topographies going on, and it's almost like a frozen wave train, right? So it doesn't move, but it maintains a very specific shape. So it leads to zero frequency, but finite range of wave numbers. And for the ocean waves, it has the frequency and also the wave number, and the um, movement is relative. So the interference is going to happen. And such interference could produce a potential standing pressure source pounding the seafloor as if uh, an earthquake was happening in the region. So that leads to the name stormquakes. Ah, okay. So uh, really complicated interaction. <laughs> and uh, uh, have lots of people studied stormquakes? So not many people have studied stormquakes, but there are a lot of people work on atmosphere, ocean, and solid earth interaction. And that's actually why I mentioned scripts is a perfect place to do this because we do have a legacy of doing this. Um, in the early days, uh, Longett, Higgins, and Hasselman, they were the first group of people trying to look into the problem and actually established the first set of models to theorize the whole process. And they named the mechanisms as the primary and secondary mechanisms for the primary and secondary micro assessments. And currently, we have the leading experts here as well, uh, Peter Gerstoff and Peter Berminski. Uh, they have been in the field for a long time and made many important contributions about how the atmosphere, ocean, and solid earth interact. And I just want to emphasize uh, how grateful uh, I am to be part of the group because of I am here, therefore, naturally, I view the Earth, the ocean, and atmosphere as one system instead of a separate parts. And because of that kind of perspective really helped me uh, to view the seismic data with an oceanography mind in it, I guess. So when you on, I know that you study earthquake processes. And I understand that you're in the midst of a very big experiment uh, that involves 50 ocean bottom seismometers in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And what's going on with that? <laughs> Thanks for asking that. This is a, a very exciting project that I'm part of. So if I ask anyone at this moment, for example, um, can you predict an earthquake? I think uh, most people will say no, right? Um, and it is true because earthquakes are very dynamic processes that really cannot be predicted at an operational level at this moment. However, uh, at the East Pacific rise, there are some special cases. There um, is a sequence of the transform faults that repeatedly have magnitude six earthquakes at the exact same spot every five years with the temporal uncertainties within about half a year. So, you know, each OBS deployment can be up to one or two years. And this is really within the range of our campaign time range. So because of that, I get to say we can predict earthquakes in that one special magical location. And that's the whole point of this uh, 50 OBS deployment is trying to capture the end of a seismic cycle, the cold seismic evolution, and early post-seismic processes. And we want to understand the 4D evolution of all these uh, processes and hope to answer the final question, to what extent can we predict an earthquake? So this project, a project is funded by NSF. We have uh, three cruises uh, and two-year OBS deployment which is very expensive and rare to be provided by NSF. And uh, it is a multidisciplinary uh, project, as you mentioned. In addition to the OBS, 
uh, components, we also have dredging. Actually, we use scripts, dredges. And we also have uh, autonomous underwater vehicles, sentry. It's going to do multiple dives. We have uh, uh, a lot of the numerical modeling from the short-term earthquake scale to long-term tectonic scale, trying to all answer this question, uh, what is going on at this place that we are able to say something about when the next event is going to happen. Uh, the 50 OBSs are divided into two uh, components. It's a multi-scale array. The uh, overall scale, uh, the larger scale, has about 20 OBSs. And they're put at a regular three spacing covering a segment, a uh, full segment trying to capture every direction of the possible rupture. And in addition to that, we have 30 OBSs, which are configured into three mini arrays. Each mini array would have about 10 stations and within one kilometer. And the goal of doing that, the purpose of doing this is to use them as smaller seismic antennas and trying to tune back to the photon material. So it's in the ocean, so it's not surprising there are fluid, but the fault itself can sometimes hold fluids and form a fluid pocket. Now, this kind of fluid pocket would recharge and decharge during a seismic event. In our case, we want to use antenna to track the fluid pocket and then use them as markers and then trace how the stress and strength condition has been evolving during this whole time range. Um, and so uh, I'll come back to the end is, can we learn something about the repeatable behavior and can we use these physical understandings uh, to understand other full systems? For example, the big one we have in California. So that's fascinating. Um, what are the hypotheses about why this area has this very regular fault repeat? Oh, excellent question. So the, the fault itself is not as simple as what we imagine. Sometimes it's the surface, but along the uh, direction or strike of the fault, it is segmented in different patches. The patch that often uh, are repeatedly have earthquakes are called the seismogenic zone. And in addition to these patches, there are other zones. For example, for this part of the, uh, we're doing experiment at the GOFAR transform fault system, and they are segmented by some of the barrier zones. These barrier zones are more damaged rocks uh, and they have a lot of fluid going on. So what's magical about this is these barrier, barrier zones seem to serve at uh, multiple purposes. It sometimes act as an agent to nucleate the earthquake to propagate. But at the same time, it also serves as a barrier, as the name indicated, to stop the rupture to go further. Mm -hmm. So we think these barrier zones are the key that is playing the nucleation and termination process of a larger magnitude six earthquakes. And before a large earthquake, there are very clear precursory patterns, ongoing intense uh, foreshocks often occur in these barrier zones and eventually lead up to the observed main shocks. And immediately after the main shocks, these micro earthquakes in the barrier zone shut down immediately and then gradually building up the strength again. Now, the hypothesis here, we have a few. One is there are some aseismic slip propagating mm -hmm. across the whole zone and leading up to the final rupture. As the uh, aseismic slip propagate, one would be able to see the micro earthquakes go along with this propagation and eventually propagate like that. A lot, we actually know this um, likely happened because of the 2008 experiment. Now, last time there was only one station on top of the fault zone. And so we didn't know the details. This time we put 50 there, and hopefully to know everything. And, and now the other thing is there were likely to be a fluid migration. Now fluid migration sometimes would uh, change the stress condition and more importantly, uh, change the material strengths. So the rock can go softer or weaker as we can imagine and make it easier to slip. 
so that comes back to the idea of having multiple mini arrays and to track the fluid pocket and to use them to see if anything would tell us uh, would tell us anything about such scenarios. Uh, so these are the two um, hypotheses that we're currently having in mind. Um, but as we learn more from the data, we could be all wrong. As I said, data are always correct. It, only the series can be wrong. <laughs> That's great. What an amazing experiment that is uh, yeah, to have those many resources to look at this really complicated area. It's uh, such a luxury in science. Indeed. And, yeah, congratulations on uh, getting that together and being successful. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yes, I'm a part of a very large PI team. And you know, I'm just a, 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 a one of the seismologists working on the mini array data. But I have to say, we, we're very lucky and grateful for NSF support to pursue such a large project. So when you won, um, we have talked in the past about some of the exciting things going on in the general field of seismology. What are the big things uh, that you think are the seismology of the future? What are people going to be focused on 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Well, you know, my research is the future of seismology. <laughs> As I, I have been saying during the job talk, um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, I, I think, there are many important things happening um, in seismology at this moment because we're at a great uh, time. The data, um, um, we, have some, we have a lot of data at this moment and this data have been accumulated over uh, one or two decades for now. So we're at a turning, we're at a point that potentially we can make breakthroughs in multiple directions. And regarding the large questions, um, I would quote the NSF vision document uh, that recently that has recently been published uh, for uh, advising the NSF EAR, EAR program to proceed for the next decade. And they listed multiple big questions. And one of the most striking to me or important to me is the question, what is an earthquake? Now, this is almost sounds like too simple to answer, right? So what is an earthquake? But the, the reason that we start to raise or ask this question again is because more and more observations start to suggest that earthquakes are not the sudden movement of two faults and produce seismic waves anymore. Um, instead, there is a spectrum of sleep events happening on the fault all the time. From a seismic slip we described to some sort of the slip events radiating part of the seismic energies to the very fast earthquakes. But they all happen on the same fault, right? So how could that actually reflect the fault condition? How could the natural system accommodate such a diverse set of uh, events occurring over a very large range of temporal and spatial scales? Um, so I think that's a very exciting question that has been uh, highlighted. The other part is uh, how does the ecosystem or how does the critical zone change um, actually relate to the solid earth processes? Mm -hmm. uh, so, and also the climate. Basically, I think I'm not saying the question perfectly well, but the idea is how does um, all these spheres interfere and interact each other, right? So biosphere, uh, critical zone, hydrosphere, um, and, uh, um, and uh, these solitaires. So part of my research focus on um, environmental geophysics. And this is really not that a new topic. Environmental geophysics has been around for a while. Uh, but what's special is that now seismic observations and uh, geodetic observations are at the resolution that can really help to answer some of the high resolution shallow processes. So this is again a great timing to be in the field to work on that. Um, for example, uh, one of my students, he's working on uh, landslides in Alaska. Now, we know Alaska landslides has landslides, but we don't hear much about it because the observation has been hard to make. Um, either from uh, field observation or satellite imagery, it's just difficult because of the weather, 
and the mountain area condition, we have a new seismic way to observe, identify, locate, verify, and model uh, such processes. And we think this is important because as the climate has been changing, the temperature gets warmer and warmer. Alaska is extremely sensitive to these changes. And the permafrost has been thawing and continuing accelerating at the thawing speed. And what this will lead to is likely to be an enhanced productivity of landslides in the region. And once there is a larger landslide activity, it will change the local biosphere or uh, biodiversity. And the reason is landslides occur, it will change the topography, which will uh, impact the floral system in the region, changing the river path. Once the river is changed, everything follows. Mm -hmm. So we hope to look into the large set of seismic data and provide a base of what's happening now. And even though our observational period might be too short to understand the climate change aspect, but we can provide a benchmarking point for what's gonna happen to uh, forecast what's gonna happen in the future. So this is another interesting intersection point has been highlighted by the vision document. And I guess the last one uh, that has been mentioned, uh, I guess not new, but again and again, is how can earth science research reduce the risk and the toll of geohazards? And this one is very dear to my heart. Um, the question is very dear to my heart because this is a major motivation for my research is to translate physical understanding of the seismic sources um, into actions. And we really hope to have an improved uh, understanding of the problem and provide reliable and quantifiable future forecasts. Yeah, it's so important. As you were talking, I was thinking that, uh, you know, we're, as we're sitting here, uh, there was a major earthquake in Haiti uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, 7.2. And uh, although it didn't result in as many deaths as the one in 2010, 2010. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was still a, a devastating uh, event. And we haven't had one in the U.S. for some time. And I, it feels like people in the U.S. are kind of uh, a, a little bit, uh, what should I say? They, they've kind of forgotten how big a hazard it is. And of course, we on the, east, on the West Coast know that, you know, there hasn't been a major quake on the San Andreas uh, for a long time, and everybody looks at Cascadia with, uh, you know, it's been a long time since there was a really big uh, Cascadian earthquake, and uh, it's only a matter of time. And uh, these, especially these studies that help us understand what the precursors are and what we can look for uh, to, to evaluate risk, are, are just so important. I think they're gonna make the difference between, uh, in the future, they're gonna make the difference between many, many lives lost and some lives lost. And so your work is just incredible and so important. It's just a real pleasure to talk with you, Wendy Thank you so much.